Good evening. Uh, we'll go ahead and call to order the Planning Commission meeting for May 28th, 2020. Mr. Shivers, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Fellers. <coughs> Commissioner Hackway. Here. Commissioner Leeson. Here. Commissioner Long. Here. Commissioner McLaren. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Chairman Tetrick. Here. Commissioner Watson. We have a quorum. Thank you. Item number two, approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Any questions or comments? Was that this year? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was in February, right? February 27th? It's what it said. I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, I, I had to check to too. Sure anybody else remember that or not? Mr. Chairman, I move the minutes from February 27th, 2020 meeting be approved as presented. Thank you. Do we have a second? That's right. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, new business, Mr. Shivers. All right, can we start at item number two tonight? Sounds great. All right, so we have received a special use permit application for 3625 Southwest 10th Street. This area is located within El Dorado Extraterritorial Jurisdiction, or ETJ, so it's just outside city limits. Uh, this is my zoomed out photo, so you can see West Central there at the top. And then cutting diagonally across the map is the Kansas Turnpike. The property is currently zoned agricultural residential. It is very, very limited in what uses are allowed, which is primarily agriculture and very, very low density residential. Uh, the application tonight is for an accessory apartment, which is defined as a residential unit that is located detached from a principal single family residential unit, which is a very complicated way to say it's just a second home. So there's a primary home on the property and they're asking to build a second home. Uh, they are still working on their house plans. They're looking at a roughly 2,000 square foot home and a detached garage in the shaded yellow area here on the map. So special use permits allow very specific uses or approve a specific site plan and building. Uh, unlike rezonings that approve a category or range of land uses. So this is very specific. This property is currently uh, surrounded by all agriculture. Well, let me back up. So tonight what we're doing, because the applicant is still working on their home designs, we're approving the use. So what we're voting to approve or deny or think about is just a second home in this area as they work out their final plans. Since this is located in our joint jurisdictional area of Butler County, uh, they will be reviewing the final building plans, providing building inspections, and issuing a building permit if approved. On May 26th, this Tuesday, two days ago, the Butler County Commission reviewed this request and voted to support the request. Property is currently served by Rural Water. They've been working with the county to ensure that their on-site sewage treatment uh, via the lagoon there will be appropriate. Uh, and to cover a few of our criteria for special use permits, it is, is and has been accessible by emergency services. Uh, we believe a second home is compatible with the area, since what we're doing tonight is approving a second home and not any type of subdivision or more intensive zoning. So it's a very specific one extra home. So with all that being said, uh, City of El Dorado does support this request. I'd like to take a moment to invite the applicants up, talk just a little bit more about the request. Can you please state your name and your address? Sure. My name is Suzette Moore and property owner. I'm Tripa Carlton and the seller. And we're gonna build a second home in the yellow area for me and my family to live and help keep up the land and and we're still going to keep it agricultural and um, we're going to try not to keep uh, use up as much as much as that as because <laughs> it's in Brome right now and we have cattle production there and we want to continue that and keep the it in the family farm and keep it going we've already contacted the utilities and everything is going the water the uh, rural water we've contacted and it's been a to be they said uh, it should accessible to the second home and would be fine and same with the sewage to use the same lagoon that's already on the picture so mm -hmm. the sewage would still be approved and be the same mm -hmm. oh and evergy if the electric company mm -hmm. approved putting a pole out there and everything too mm -hmm. Uh, you're going to access this, this off of 10th Street then? 
There is an access road right beside there. There's a little uh, access road right there to the right. And that access road goes all the way back to the back of our property. And that's going to be where the drive is. And there's a, already a small drive where we always keep our hay bales right there. Um, we have two sections of hay bales right there. And so uh, and there's a small drive where the hay bales are actually sitting. Mm -hmm. And that. It's right off the access road in the 10th Street corner, and that will be the drive. Mm -hmm. I drove by that today, and it's it's just a dirt road right now. Is that mm -hmm. what it is? Mm -hmm. That's going to remain a dirt road then? The access road is yes, because the, um, the oil well people go back there, and that's how we go back there and take care of our cows and um, when it's... And where does your property end to the east to there? Is that the, the white line? Is that your property line? Yes. The access road is shared by these... Um, the S2 property owners, and um, that we share that all the time. And the oil uh, people right now t maintain that road in conjunction with us because most of this stuff is on our. We do, a, a, we use that access road almost every day with our cattle at the back, and so. You share that road with the, with the homeowner to the east, and that what you said. We share it when you meant that. You mean the homeowner, the property owner to the east? Is that whose whose road is it? It's called an access road, and it's really in between property lines um, that we both maintain and share. We our property line is goes up to that access road. Both of our property lines go right there. Yes. And so, we. Do you know who owns the road? I don't know. Our maps are not always perfect. Just parcel lines. <laughs> so, yeah. So you're aware of that part. Um, I'm not positive of who actually owns the road, but we have always maintained it, and because the house that they have is clear down there they never go back there except to hunt so okay any other questions what that number did you want for jay i was like i have one for jay too <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and i think we've covered mine last time when we had the accessory apartment the one we did just but i'll ask him anyway okay if there's nothing else thank you okay go ahead you go first, maybe you're covering mine. All right. <laughs> what is the special use permit for out here? They've obviously got the area and the space to put a house in. Good question. Is there so much acreage that has to be involved? Or? Kind of. So the AR zoning requires a minimum lot size of 40 acres. It is just for this purpose as far as agriculture goes, utilities, the roadways, none of those things are made for great densities. And so right now the zoning says they can have one house on their, um, obviously this is just a part of their acreage. I'm zoomed in. It's a much larger acreage there. So by ordinance, they're allowed one home. The special use permit allows a second home versus going the other methods of subdividing property, changing ownerships, that method or rezoning. So this is, this is exactly how it's supposed to work is, is you have that, that one simple way to get one extra home. Um, the special use permit, is that for a single family residence? Even though it says accessory apartment, you, it can't be a multi-family deal, right? That is correct. And I know we talked about this last time. Right, right. The yeah, verbiage we, is what is confusing. Yeah, we, okay. yeah, we, I think next time we do a zoning ordinance update, as we do about yeah. once a year, we'll probably change the term. Like a lot of cities use the words accessory dwelling unit. ADU is very common, just it's a dwelling unit, just one. It's not... It's not an apartment. And, and last time we had some neighbors that got a little concerned about the, the term and called me about it and were concerned about it being a full apartment complex. So, yes, one single family unit. That's, I was pretty sure about that. Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, at this time, I guess we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone that would like to speak? Okay. We will close the public hearing. Is there any discussion amongst the commission? Questions, clarifications. And actually, uh, Commissioner Long, to tack on to your question earlier, 
the access road next to it. So our priority and the county's priority is to ensure that they have access to a right of way. So even if they have a deal, an easement, or they work out something with the neighbors, that's fine. Should something ever change, they will be in the perfect location to get access to Southwest 10th. So that's the part we have to ensure that they do, and yes. they do with this location. Okay, if there are no other questions, I would entertain a motion. I move to recommend approval of case number 20-04-SUP, a request by Teresa Moore for a special use permit to allow an accessory apartment on the property located at 3625 Southwest 10th Street for the reasons set forth in a staff recommendation and heard at this public hearing. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Shivers, can we have a roll call? Commissioner Hackler? Yes. Commissioner Leeson? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Chairman Tetrick? Yes. All right. The motion passes to recommend approval 5 to 0. So this will go to City Commission on June 15th, and I will follow up with you guys. Okay, we will move on, I assume, to item number three. Yes, sir. Okay. So this is a, another special use permit. In fact, all three denied are special use permits for very specific things. Uh, this one takes place at 1139 Southeast Blue Stem Road. It's the yellow highlighted property up here on the map. Today, it is a four and a half acre mobile home park with some RVs in it. Um, so I went ahead and added the red area. As you remember, in the past years, we worked on some expansions for Deer Grove RV Park. Their existing RV park is in the red shaded area. The yellow box is going to be an expansion to that area. So their proposal with the special use permit will add approximately 57 RV spots. Uh, the ordinance calls this a campground, an establishment primarily engaged in providing overnight or short-term camping sites for RVs, travel trailers, campers, or tents, though I believe their focus is on the RV and travel trailer part of that. The current zoning for this property and all the surrounding properties is MP, Mobile Home Park. That does allow mobile homes as well as single family residential. So you'll see a mix of both of these on this particular block. Um, so what's interesting about this versus the last uh, special use permit we worked with the Donges is on, is that the site is completely built out. The interior roadways are there, the utilities are there, the lots are lined out. Um, they plan to close off access to Blue Stem and funnel all their traffic through the existing Deer Grove Park up to Highway 54, which is excellent because one thing that we usually look at is what's the traffic impact, so we won't be adding anything else to Blue Stem Road. Um, so as you can see here, we've got mobile homes there to the west, we've got some scattered residential to the north of uh, the RV park, low density residential there to the east and south. This is in our ETJ, our extraterritorial jurisdiction. Uh, along with the other case, Butler County Commission reviewed it on May 26th, this last Tuesday, and they voted to recommend approval of the case. Uh, so with that being said, the city does support this uh, special use permit request, and I'd like to invite the applicant, Natalie and Tim, up here to talk a little bit more about their site plan that's up here on the TV screen. Name is Tim Donges, address 2873 Southeast US uh, Highway 54, Elroy, Kansas. Um, uh, basically, this property came to us um, after we had got approval on the other parcel for expansion on the RV park. So um, it's currently a natural fit for what we're doing business wise. Uh, it's kind of a no brainer to purchase and hopefully get permission to go ahead and move forward to transition to RV use within the park. Um, one of the designs that's important to us, uh, also reason for closing off Blue Stem Road, was through the RV park industry. It is uh, always recommended to have one entrance, one exit due to the fact you can control traffic flow. And it flows directly past our office. So everything fits really well with what, we, what our current layout is. Uh, again, Jay talked about the utilities already in place. We'll have to modify a few things, but for the most part, it's a no-brainer for us to develop into. Um, it will also give us access to, um, during higher use times for the RV park, of, um, of course, allowing uh, more construction workers to stay during big projects like the refinery, the refinery has during big turnaround years. The other thing that really helps us out with 
is in the past we've tried to attract uh, RV clubs, which is generally uh, older retiree folks that are in the, uh, are in these organizations. And in the past, we kind of lacked a little bit on space. And this will help us uh, to more aggressively pursue those groups and feel more comfortable about reserving those uh, a year out. Because in the past, most of those reservations on their trips that they make um, in different states is usually a year ahead of time where they try to plan their itinerary for the most part. So it's definitely going to help us uh, bring more, more people to our area and hopefully spend more money in our community. Um, we're going to follow, of course, any, any regulations that the city has and our permitting uh, part will go through the county and, of course, be following all the regulations to go along with that. Um, if you have any questions at this time, you know, feel free to, feel free to ask. There are no more questions. Thank you. Okay, at this time we will open the public hearing. Would anybody like to speak? Okay, great. Uh, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, any discussion amongst the commission? Any questions? Mr. Sears, could you go back to the, the larger Entirety of the RV park. I think, or is it property to stay in? I, I think that you're maybe not understanding too. He, he should have maybe highlighted in red. The whole long strip to the left of the yellow is all ours as well. Okay. That is part of the property. It's just um, a different zoning um, and it was broke out. And that's, so it's our street. So, I mean, it's not different zoning. It's still the mobile home park. We're talking about that long skinny piece. The long skinny to the piece. Left. Yeah, to, yeah okay. to the left of the park is Kaffir Road. And it borders all the way down Capitol Road, clear to the end of it. It's a dead end road, and so that is all ours as well. What, so. what, Natalie? When do you hope to have all this completed? You, you said long range goal or future goal? Is it? Well, we was wanting to have it completed within the next this year, but I'll be honest with the COVID. You know, it's kind of thrown us a little bit behind because business is it's down because people are not traveling because they can't. So that does affect us somewhat, but um, we've been lucky enough to have quite a few workers still in our park um, that are building a, a large um, a railroad line on 177. And so we do have those workers, but we also had all the refinery workers leave because they're not working those uh, people as well. Yeah. So hopefully we'll bring some of those back in and business will pick back up and the income will the extra income that we needed to do it that all went away. But uh, these mobile that. homes that are now occupied, you're going to wait for those people just to naturally. Uh, that is off. correct. Uh, the, the, I'll be honest, the people that are there are very good people. They've been there for a long time and I have no reason to make them move. And I would love to let them stay there at least until they decide themselves to leave. So, so there's about, um, actually kind of where the road was going to come through. There's a group of about five of them there that have been there for a long time, and they don't want to leave. And and I don't really, you know, like I said, they're good people. So. And that's not going to stop you from developing this? I, I don't, uh, no. Okay. I, I think we can develop around it. Uh, most of the, uh, that park is empty now. There's very few or, uh, mobile homes in it now. We removed <laughs> out six, and it was already lacking probably ten out of the, that it had in there so and and so we you know cleaned it up and got that stuff done already that's all been removed and mm -hmm. and uh and now you got we, we have two more that we're looking at getting out there still or 
well, there's one probably possibly going to come up that we may be able to get out as well, so that'll help. So one to two, so depending on how it goes. So, so. You know, Tim mentioned the um, preferable access to this addition, having everybody go by your office out there um, and closing off the loose stem. Is there any concern from city or county or whatever for um, having a one entrance into something this deep for fire response or anything? Or is that closing off that entrance, you know, having to go that far down in there? I mean, I just didn't know if fire marshal had anything to say about, any, you know, closing off the blue stem side of it or having a gate so they could get into something bad was to happen to one of the campers catch fire or something. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, they, if they bring a ladder truck or whatever they're driving that day, I just wondered whether it be enough accessibility for them to respond to emergencies, well, either ambulance the, or fire. And that is something that we have to follow as the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. So we have to design roads a certain width, turns to be a certain radius, or a certain width to adjust for that. So those are all things that we do have to follow okay. through NFPA to allow for emergency vehicle okay. access. So on that part, road system has to be designed that way, according to NFPA. In which it, it, it's currently, uh, the road width already is wide enough to access um, the fire trucks and everything. The only thing we're gonna be changing a little bit is, like you said, the closing of Blue Stem Road but we're going to have that turn in there to make that turn. That turn is going to be a 30 foot wide. U in there. Mm -hmm. 30 foot. And, and the U shape is, like I said, across the United States, these loops, they call them, just like you have at the Elder Red Lake. Those are, that is a specific industry design. And then also taking into account NFPA uh, rules on, on what they feel uh, and how they feel RV parks should be built. And I'll be honest, it's not much different than having a 45 foot motorhome with a tow behind it. Okay. Uh, ladder trucks, really not much difference in size. In fact, the RV may be bigger. So, is there, you have I guess to make them the enough. gist of most of my question, though, is uh, with the depth mm -hmm. of having to travel zigzag you know, through there to get back to basically where our mobile home number one or whatever it sets now, right. is that. Is there any concern of any uh, fire accessibility, not, not to get the trucks in there, but because it's so deep into the lot mm -hmm. and not having a second entrance closer to a major road? That was what I was wondering if anybody had, had Well, any it'd be, cons it'd be considering what we currently have in the city of El Dorado. I mean, Jake <laughs> talk about, you know, some of our developments like up in Vintage Place. How, how long does it take us to get to back into that furthest house? So it'd be very similar, okay. you know, it's actually probably gonna be less distance than that, but it would be a similar situation mm -hmm. where you only have one insurance basically to get back to that house towards the end of that loop back in there. And, and I, I believe that it's, um, it's probably more accessible to come back to it than it would have been our other, ex our other expansion because at that point they wouldn't know where to go anyway, so. Um, except looking for the black smoke if it was a fire. So um, um, we, we have stuff numbered and you can look for it, but every time an ambulance shows up now, we all run out to show them where to go because they don't know what to do. So mm -hmm. most of the time I don't know where they're going. <laughs> and I just say, which, who are you looking for? And I point the way, but you know, that's not gonna happen in the middle of the night, but, but they have to look for numbers already, so. Yeah, just like they would an address, I guess. So, so what was I saying? So. I'm just curious on it. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I, I certainly share Mr. Hackler's concern there, but I also appreciate that our level of site plan review is it's yeah. relative, it's sure. relative to land use, and and I'll trust that further down the line, when 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 they get reviewed for other permits, they may may need. I, and and to me, it's 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 about having two ways in and out. If if something happens and that drive gets blocked or or, or a fire is occurring, that's that's restricting access along that single point of entry. But we can also see that that if push comes to shove, solving that problem along Blue Stem 
if a fire agency or an emergency services agency uh, felt like it was a compelling problem, the solution is pretty easy. So, um, just a matter of just a matter of pushing further down the line and going through its process. Any other questions? They, if they switch it to a campground, can they still have the mobile homes or houses in? Yes. Yep. So that's still the base zoning is still allowed by right. If they choose to continue it or bring it back someday, it's just the campground that requires a special use permit. So yep, they can do both. Or one or the other with the special use permit. Mr. Shivers, could you could you give us a little more context on the January 11? 2005 letter from the interim director at the county, Mr. Year out. Sure. So I was, I was just talking to Tim about that a minute ago. So over the years, the trailer park, the mobile home park has had RVs that have come and gone. And so uh, we know that those are small numbers. And knowing their goals, it's going to be completely RVs one day. So what I recommended to Natalie was that, Natalie and Tim, is that if they wanted to be all RVs, I asked them to go ahead and apply for a special use permit now. So the grandfathering says that if you have a non-conforming use, which this would be currently, um, it can continue to occur. It's been happening since before that regulation was adopted. That letter was from 2005. We took jurisdiction in 2009. <clears throat> so it was grandfathered way back. Um, however, like I said, it was small numbers. So knowing their plans, I asked them to go ahead and apply for a special use permit. If it's approved, it'll cover the entire area, covers all the RVs, and then as they work through and mobile homes move out, <coughs> fulfill their long-term plan for Deer Grove. So that's what it is. It's it's going from a small amount to fifty-seven. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I would entertain a motion. I move to recommend approval of case number twenty dash zero five dash SCP. A request by Natalie and Tim. <laughs> for a special use permit to allow the campground on the property located at 1139 Southeast Blue Stem Road for reasons set forth in the staff recommendations and heard at this public meeting. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Mr. Shivers, can we have a roll call? Commissioner Hackler? Yes. Commissioner Leeson? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Chairman Tetrick. Yes. All right, that is five to zero to recommend approval of the special use permit. And that will be on June 15th that it goes to our city commission. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Shivers, item number one. Yeah, let me grab my notes. Okay, so this is another special use permit for 111 South Hogaboom. Property is currently zoned R1 single family residential and surrounded by C1 general business to the east, north, and west. Now typically with rezonings, I put up the zoning maps. Uh, with special use permits, we usually just talk about a specific thing. I should have had the zoning layer because it is uh, one residential property surrounded by commercial, if you've driven by the area. Uh, so the specific request is for an in-home hair salon. Uh, so this falls under our supplementary district regulations in the zoning ordinance. Uh, it allows certain home occupations, has a list of allowed ones, a couple by special use permit, and some that are not allowed. Uh, so there's some base regulations for it, such as if you're operating the business, you have to live in your home, in the home that you're doing it in. You cannot create noise, odor, emissions, things that are going to bother your neighbors, and you certainly cannot generate more traffic than is average for your neighborhood. So in other words, you can do a lot of things from home, but you can't bother your neighbors. It's still a residential area. Uh, so a few examples of what's allowed I have on here, the professional offices, um, architects, engineering, accounting, all those things that, that can be done from home, tailoring, daycare, um, even art, dance, and music schools, limited to five kids at one time or less. Um, we don't want to fill up all that parking. And so there's two uses specifically that are required, um, that require a special use permit, bed and breakfast and barber and beauty services, which is what this falls under. Uh, some more information about what they're looking to do. This is just a part-time uh, hair salon for them. It's weekday evenings and it's weekends by appointment only. One customer, one car at a time. Um, so this is just a side job for these guys. 
Um, as far as our criteria for special use permits, we're not looking at any new structures, no new signs, nothing like that. It's accessible by all our municipal emergency services. It's accessible um, and connected to all our city utilities. We're not anticipating any major um, utility upgrades needed for, for such an addition. Um, as far as compatible, um, I chuckled to myself as I was looking at this as far as compatibility goes <laughs> because it is a residential property and it's probably the residential nature of it that's out of place here and not the hair salon part. So um, this house was built one year before the hotel next to it, so the house was here first, followed by a lot of the commercial development. Um, so we do believe it's compatible, it's a commercial use, it's not going to generate a lot of traffic. All those things we worry about with home occupations affecting the neighborhood, there's no neighborhood around this just commercial businesses. There is a house down there on the lower right to the southeast. It's about 800 feet away when I measured it. So I don't think they'll be too impacted by this particular use. Um, so we have done two other special use permits in the last decade for um, Barber Beauty Services and Home. One was in 2010, one was in 2017. I think most of you guys were here on South Audrey. Uh, we did not apply any conditions of those. We have not heard any complaints or had any issues with them luckily. Um, so, so far so good on those. You've probably seen in your packet, we did receive one email from the Red Coach Inn. Um, other than that, of all the notices I sent, nobody else contacted me about this one. Um, so with that said, uh, the applicants plan to be here tonight, but they had a family emergency and could not attend. Um, so I am familiar with the case and I believe Mr. Rickard is too as well. So we're happy to answer any questions you might have about it. And of course, if there are certain questions that we just can't answer, we also have the option to table it until they're available to come. Um, so you guys let me know how you'd like to proceed. So where are the clients going to park? They, there's no room in their drive, it doesn't look like to me. For it, is a, it is a short driveway, yes. So they're planning to have them in their driveway. You can only fit maybe two cars deep when you look at it. Um, for comparison's sake, I looked at the one we did in 2017, which is on South Audrey. Same situation, it was a very short, um, one car wide driveway. Uh, they actually enclosed their garage through their hair salon, so you kind of took away one parking spot on theirs. Um, and so, we've, so far, we haven't had any issues. I suspect any overflow would be on the road, but like I said, um, they're very adamant that they want one customer at a time, one car at a time. And I'm sure they're very aware of the parking uh, limitations. Yeah, that, that, that road is pretty wide, and there's not a lot of traffic on that end. Really, once you get past Sonny's, there's yeah, they're yeah. right down there at the end. Yeah, I mean, you would have to live down there to really go down there. So, yeah. Which they do. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't even actually know the house was back there. Oh, yeah. It's pretty <laughs> hidden. It is. It's really hidden. It's back there. Though. There used to be another house in there right beside them to the north. Mm -hmm. it, it got dilapidated and they pushed it over a long time ago. And I think that, that email had mentioned that these owners had mentioned to the red coach owners they'd be building a fence and they have submitted and been issued a, a fence permit so that they can build a privacy fence around a lot of their property they you said they can or they are or what they what did you will. say they, they will yeah I, I think in the letter there was a concern that they had mentioned building a fence and, and they haven't done so um i the applicants i know they'd had some homeless problems in the area there so they uh, they've been issued a building permit for a, a privacy fence to go around much of their property. I only mentioned it because it was referenced in that letter, the email. It's, it's not a requirement by any ordinance or Correct. regulation. It's just yeah. something <laughs> that they mentioned to a Correct. neighbor that they might do. So has, has the applicant been in contact with the Red Coach Inn manager? I don't know how much contact they've had. Um, all I know is that I sent out the notices and I got that long email pretty quickly about it. That's all I've heard. Does that, does that road, it allows for on-street parking, right? Like Hogaboom does? I mean, we're not like setting them up to... <laughs> I would defer to, to Mr. Rickard for that. Signs go up immediately. Look, well, like, yeah, I mean, <coughs> I, I would assume it does because most roads do. But Look, Like you mentioned, Chairman, um, it's very wide. Yeah. Now, this is not a public road. This is real owned property. So it's prescriptive in nature, the access through there. I know I've spoke to the landowner to the north as well as the applicant about what's going on in there, um, as well as the the um, hotel owner to the west or to the east. Um, haven't heard any issues. You see the email 
there. The J included in the packet. Yeah. Awesome. But there is a, I mean, there is a cross access agreement or an access easement through there that that gives this residential property legal use of that. That's amongst those private property owners. Um, so that is not a function of the city. So it's it's not it's not a public right of way. <coughs> it's it's private property. The road is considered privately developed and maintained. Right, and it's been in existence to allow access there. Um, so it's it's what you would call prescriptive easement, easement right of access. The applicant was unaware of any uh, recorded um, agreement within their deed or anything of that nature. The owner of the property to the north was the former owner of the motel. He was unaware of anything as well. It just kind of has served in that role, in that capacity since that home was built in, uh, what was that date, Jay? 1959. Yeah. <coughs> and then the hotel was uh, 1960. So likewise, since it's not right away, it's, I mean, there aren't special assessments tied to it. It's privately owned property that's been developed as a private drive. Yeah, the city does have a water line that goes down through there. We do have sewer line that crosses across it as well. Mm -hmm. So there are easements for those utilities. Okay, but not. Not right away. Not public right away. Okay. You'll see these similar situation. Um, I'm trying to think of one in town. Um, Country Club Lane that serves the golf course. That that is not a public road. It's not a public right away. Um, it was allowed. Things developed off of it. Um, so it serves in that role as private property, but access to multiple. East End of Park Lane has a property that's completely separated from right away, and there's a prescriptive easement that allows them access to their neighbor's property. So I've been talking a lot. I've been talking, well, not a lot, but two or three times over the course of this to the owner from the north um, who's interested in developing his lot there and, and about getting all together and securing a document or researching what they may have to ensure something is in place. So that's just taken care of. Okay. I'm along that same lines. Red coach is saying that the city is required to fix it, wouldn't that? Well, that's their manager, I think, that wrote that email and mm -hmm. they're unaware of, of what that is. Any other questions for the, the, quick an, the quick answer is that the city is not obligated to maintain that roadway. It, it has an address of Huggabin Drive that was assigned to it, and that's it's considered Huggabin Drive, and that's for the purpose of EMS fire service and police. Right. Okay. Is, is there any danger uh, with it being owned wholly, basically, by the Red Coach owners that, yes, they're giving access to this residence? to drive down there and turn into their driveway to access their home, but that doesn't include permission to have any cars parked on the road, you know, like somebody parked out there to go into the hair salon because there's no room in the driveway, then wouldn't they just be trespassing at that point? Because it's not accessing the property, they're parking on the property. Jay, did, that, did you have a picture of their drive entrance? Oh, no, I do. It's a friend out there. Yeah, and, and where the trucks parked, I, I think they are thinking about adding on to that area as well. I just extend in the drive over there or something. That'd be my only concern is that we're going to open a can of worms with Red Coach because the other looking, I guess, the other way as much as they can to gain access to the property through their, through their property. But I don't think they're 
gracious miss is going to extend once the car is parked yep. for two hours out on the road because somebody's getting a fancy permit or something, whatever, it takes <laughs> a long time. Like Chairman Shetrick. With special use permits, if there's a particular impact or issue, we have the ability to, to require a condition, whether it addresses parking, saying that it has to be on site, on the person's property, if that's something you're interested in, or require an additional parking spot to the side. Um, so that'd be well within our, our bounds to do on a special use permit like this. I, I think if, you know, if we were to vote to approve it as it is, then if they wanted the, the parking on Hogaboom, that would be between them and Red Coach, right? I mean. We could still approve the, the special use permit to park in their driveway, and then if they need additional, I mean, that's something they could just take care of on their own, right? Right. Well, as it stands, the special use permit would allow them to do that in-home hair salon. That's all, And that's all we really should worry about. Right. Now, the condition is if there's, for example, if, if some of both neighboring property owners showed up with concerns about that, you know, that'd be a time we could do that. Or even right now as we discuss it. So it, it's, it's a good condition that could be well within the bounds of, of this one. It's up to you guys um, if you see that being an issue. Well, I guess my larger thought is that, I mean, if, if, if they can satisfy the, the requirements in, in the zoning regs for parking, then, then they can satisfy it. And I don't, it doesn't make it extra special or extra enforceable for us to, to, to add that stipulation. That's kind of where I'm at. Stipulation's I mean, already. Yeah. It's already in here. Yeah, I think it's going to be one or two cars at the absolute maximum. And, and you know, an additional challenge could be if the homeowners themselves decide to park on Hogaboom and let their customers park in their driveway, it gets difficult to enforce a condition. Yes. So, any other questions for Jay? And then I'll open the public hearing if not. Okay, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody else like to speak? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, any discussion amongst the commission? I think back to, to about a third of all the old westerns, you know, where water rights were, were kind, of a, kind of a struggle. And I, I think about this private drive, it is privately owned. I agree. You see, I mean, I, it could also be the same thing for them even getting to their house, right? I right. Mean, it wouldn't exactly. just have to be the special use permit, right? But I don't know that, you know. Well, wouldn't they be grandfathered in for the a actual access, but not for the use of parking on the actual road? Because that road, I mean, the road, they can't, at this point, they can't. You know, put a fence up across their driveway and say we own the property. You can't act, you can't drive on it anymore because they've used it for fifty, some odd sixty years. Yeah. But I, I just worry about uh, us approving this and adding to the possibility without something in there saying, yeah, that's fine, and except for you can't add parking onto the neighbor's property that's just an access road for your driveway. Well, and. I mean that that's the part that makes me the most the most nervous. If if it's not if it's not a dedicated right of way and if there's not a formal cross access agreement by either party. Uh, I think you know, we think it, we we looked at some of the approved by right home locks and, and like dance lessons, they could have up to five students. Um, and why that's different than Well, yeah. and I don't know, as far as like the access, uh, I work with Roger Kessinger on some things like this, and the way he, the way I kind of understand it is a prescriptive easement is like a form of grandfathering. This house was there first, they have guaranteed access across private property. Um, so I don't know what there's limitations. My understanding is that with a lot of pres prescriptive easements, they're so old, there isn't a document that's on file saying this is an easement, it's just that this was here first, you're always gonna be having access. That's, yes, that's but my it was- that. Yeah, but it's grandfathered well, into be, it, it was grandfathered in to be a private home, not be a business. That's what I we're grandfathered. I thought about the easement. 
There's no grandfathering in the home. That's that's all conforming everything by the book. Right. Yeah. It's just the access right. and whether it's a prescriptive access agreement or not. Okay. Just leave it like it. They're asking for it. If it becomes a problem, why add special regulations on when it may not be a problem? <coughs> Don't they have to already with special use park in that property? They are required as a homeowner just to provide two parking spaces. That's all we require. We don't tell them where they can and can't park. Just that they provide two spaces. And by regulation, the the business would add a single space. It does not. No. So home occupations don't require anything additional. Okay. <coughs> Just as long as you're not creating that traffic and the noise and the odors and stuff. There's no specific additional parking requirement. Okay. Are you, didn't you mention though that the um, applicant saying this is the evening and weekend proposal? Yes, yes, that is what it is. It's weekday evenings. I mean, they can basically do anything if we approve it anyway. But and weekends by appointment. Yeah. But that's their intent is to do weekends and evenings. Right, right. This isn't a full time. 10 hours a day that they're open with business. And this is an owner occupied residence? Correct. So that, that means that the, the people that live there, the only ones that can do this work, right? Like they can't yes. bring in outside folks and like you make it correct. a full pledge. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That one's spelled out in our home occupation. That, I've summarized it here on this list of three, but there's about seven. And one of them is that you have to reside in the home and it has to be your home okay. to operate your small business there. And they can't, they cannot bring in another employee, Correct. another. Okay. Yep. So this we're talking about, we're a, talking about one salon worker. Correct. Yeah. Jeremy yeah. Tetrick's imagining the massive interstate <laughs> highway sign that says he wants super cuts. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> he, he wants a pedicure and a vendor. Yeah. Right. The so whole works. It has to be first and foremost the house that you live in. I mean, I think we can just leave it as it is then. I mean, because they could technically park in the driveway. And, I mean, they would meet everything they need to. And I know that that's their goal. They only want one customer, one car. And they, they did not make this application because of a cited violation? So they did begin operations this year. Um, and then I believe it was Scott that just let them know what it requires, and then they immediately applied and got on our okay. schedule. So okay. that's what it was. So they did just start. I think it was right before the pandemic started. So I don't know if they truly were. Yeah, I, did, I don't know that they even had a client or anything. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Timing's everything. Yeah. yeah. Right, Scott. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moving a new building, closer down. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if there are none, I would entertain a motion. I move to recommend approval of case number 20-03-SUP as requested by Nathan and Susan Dick for a special use permit to allow Barber Beauty Services on property located at 111 South Hogaboo Drive for the reason set forth by the staff recommendations and heard at this public hearing. Thank you. Do we have a second? Mr. Sugars, can we have a roll call? Please. Commissioner Hackler? Yes. Commissioner Leeson? Yes. Commissioner Long? No. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Chairman Tetrick? Yes. All right. The vote is four to one. The motion to recommend approval moves forward. Thank you. Okay. Any old business? No old business. Okay. Any staff items? We have one application for another special use permit for a June meeting. I believe it's June 25th, um, but you'll be getting, it's, it's the fourth Thursday of the month. Uh, and then Mr. Long, you had asked me about the sales tax committee since you are um, planning commission representative. I talked to Tabitha. She said they're looking to have their meetings in June and July. I think they got pushed back a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And I think they may be doing them via Zoom. 
possibly. <laughs> Is that something you have access to? I can, I can do that. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like doing that, but we don't, I mean, this wouldn't work. I mean, how big is the committee? Seven or eight? Yeah. Nine? Uh, it's a pretty good sized number. Yeah. Um, well, last year we sat around at two tables about this size. Yeah. And that's all they have for staff items. It, and things are changing quickly. Yeah, it could. Uh, so they'll be in touch. Okay. I can zoom, but I don't like to zoom. <laughs> I'm not a good zoomer. <laughs> okay, if there is nothing else, do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>